Call the meeting uh, to order. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Janet Rutledge. I'm the MLA for Burnaby North and the chair of the Select Standing Committee on Finance and Government Services, a committee of the Legislative Assembly that includes MLAs from the government and opposition parties. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting this morning in Prince George, which is located on the traditional territories of the Clay Clay Dene people. I would also like to welcome everyone who is listening to and participating in today's meeting on the Budget 2022 consultation. Our committee is currently seeking input on priorities for the next provincial budget and has heard a number of presentations over the past month. British Columbians can also share their views by making written comments or by filling out the online survey. Details are available on our website at bcledge.ca forward slash FGS budget. The deadline for all input is this Thursday, September 30th, 2021 at 5 p.m. We will carefully consider all input and make recommendations to the Legislative Assembly on what should be included in Budget 2022. The committee intends to release its report in November. For this morning's meeting, all presenters will be making individual presentations. Each presenter has five minutes for their presentation, followed by five minutes for questions from committee members. All audio from our meetings is broadcast live on our website and a complete, trans complete transcript will also be posted. I'll now ask members of the committee uh, to introduce themselves, starting with the Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair, and uh, it's great to be here in Prince George. I'm Ben Stewart, the MLA for Kelowna West and uh, the housing critic. Good morning, everyone. I'm Harvinder Sandhu, MLA for Vernon Monashi, coming to you from the unceded and traditional territory of the Okanagan Indian Nations. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Starchuk, MLA for Surrey Cloverdale, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, which include the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Semiama. Good morning. My name is Greg Kyle. I'm the MLA for Shoe Swap, and I'm the, uh, currently the BC Liberal Labour Critic. My name is Megan Dykeman. I'm looking forward to your presentation. I'm the MLA for Langley East. My name is Jagroop Broad. I'm the MLA for Surrey Fleetwood. Good morning. My name is Lauren Dirksen. I'm the MLA for Caribou Chilcotin and the Rural Development Critic. And assisting the committee today are Jennifer Errol and Stephanie Raymond uh, from the Parliamentary Committee's office and Amanda Heffelfinger and Simon Dalat from Hansard Services. Uh, so uh, let's proceed with our first presentation. Uh, so um, our first presentation is uh, Donna Flood, BC Hospice Palliative Care Association. Uh, Donna, you can come uh, to the table. Uh, so you have uh, five minutes. Uh, and we will um, uh, try to time it as closely as possible. And um, Jennifer will hold up a sign to let you know when you have 30 seconds, just so that you okay, can perfect. Uh, wrap it up. And you're comfortable if I take my mask off? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Donna Flood. I'm the president of the BC Hospice Palliative Care Association. It's an association that's a member organization that has been around for over 35 years. We represent hospice, hospices throughout the province. There's probably over 50 hospices. They range from memberships of one person, which may be just one lady sitting at her kitchen table that's providing care in her community, to hospices like Victoria Hospice and Connect Place that are multi-million dollar organizations. What we're trying to do is to create grief and bereavement into something that um, is better supported and better recognized and better evidence-based across the province. Right now, there is no formal grief and bereavement programs um, and funding put towards it. We've now found that through COVID and through the reconciliation crisis, there has been a 500% increased request for grief programming. What we're hoping to do is we've put forward different blocks of funding that we're looking for, but really what we're looking to do is to really do a deep dive on what the current state is, what is currently out there, who is offering it, and who is needing it. And with that, to do a gap analysis of what's needed, create programs to support 
support people, but all, not only that, but to create educational programs so that we can give capacity to these small hospices. Prince George itself um, is a multi-million dollar hospice. We're very fortunate that we have the capacity and the resources to, to provide uh, grief and bereavement care, but we'd really like to see that being offered right across the provinces. Um, so, so we're looking at, again, creating a strategic plan to allow us to determine what that will look like moving forward. And with that, there's also unresolved grief. I'm not sure if you are familiar with unresolved grief. Unresolved grief creates addiction issues. It creates mental health issues. When people don't get through their grief, and we see that a lot in our Aboriginal communities, where it's almost like an onion, where it's layered and layered and layered until it's just unable to do anything, and that's where I believe a lot of our homeless and um, community problems are stemming from. So we would like to start creating evidence-based programs that are consistent across the province so that everyone has the same access to these programs, that they're programs that are evidence-based, that we work together with the universities, through other organizations, through the health authorities, to really create proper, vetted, grief and bereavement programs. So we've put in our, our document the different layers that we would be doing that with. So the first one is just creating provincial leadership. That's finding out who our stakeholders are, bringing them all together, helping us do the current state analysis. And then uh, workforce support and training, again, that's developing the education and programs for that unresolved grief. In Victoria, you're blessed to have two of the best um, experts in that in the country, and we would like to be able to utilize those resources to provide that right across the province. Someone in Fort Nelson should have the same access to grief support as someone that's downtown Vancouver. Um, we also want to then a wide range of grief support programs um, for children, for adults, for men, for culturally diverse communities. We really want to have those programs, again, evidence-based spread across the province so that access for everyone is there. And um, again, evidence and research, I feel strongly that whenever you put a program together, whenever we're going to go into something, we need to have exact measures that we can report back on so that we actually know the work that we're doing. Is it effective? Is it reaching our targeted audience? Are we doing what we purport to do? So again, I thank you for the opportunity to talk. Again, I am very, very privileged in Prince George to be able to, I'm also the ED of the Prince George Hospice to oversee the work that we do here. And I would love to see that totally stretched across our province. So thank you for the consideration of our proposal. Thank you, Donna. And uh, now I'll ask uh, members of the committee uh, if you have uh, questions for Donna about her, her uh, proposal. Mike? Sure, and uh, thank you, Donna. Um, I always appreciate an eyes up presentation uh, when, when it's coming because you speak from the heart. Um, you talked about creating evidence-based programs, um, and so I'm, I'm curious if you have to reinvent that wheel or if it exists somewhere else uh, in the country, and if it doesn't uh, exist, then how long would it take to develop that program. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, where we're moving towards again is a sophistication with our, our programs. The um, Ontario Hospice Palliative Care Association has an accredited service that they've developed right across the province there. We in Prince George have now adapted it. We'll be the first um, non-Ontario hospice to be accredited through there. And within there, they have policy and standards of which to make these programs. So we would utilize those, as well as utilizing our own um, academic resources that we have here. Um, both in Victoria, Prince George, and Canuck Place, we utilize the... Um, universities all the time to ensure that we are meeting best standards and evidence base and in the development of those measures that I think are key to moving the work forward. So thank you. Lauren. Thank you very much, Donna. We had a similar presentation yesterday in Victoria. It sounds like mm -hmm. you folks are trying to kind of present together and, and push uh, push this uh, effort forward. Is that the case? Yeah, and that was Kevin Harder, I believe, from yeah, Victoria Hospice. I've yes. Uh, again, he's very fortunate that he um, is sort of the, the center of excellence for, for hospice care and um, is the center of education. So it would be working hand in hand. Um, 
but his has primarily been on hospice and the, the clinical care, so we want to extend that into the grief and bereavement care. And when we talked about the experts, that was under his um, direction that we have those. So, yeah, it's all um, working together. He is actually the vice president um, on our association. So. I see. And so how is the structure? I mean, it sounds like you guys are very independent, but uh, is it the BC Hospice Association together? Well, um, it, it was very fragmented, to tell you the truth. We were very siloed, and we really weren't even sure what we were offering our membership because it's a membership organization. And so, like I said, we have about 50 hospices out throughout the, pro the province. So what we want to do is we want to collaborate stronger. We want to be able to share the resources of the bigger hospices with those of the smaller hospices, or even what we're finding virtually here in Prince George, that I'm able to care for people in Fort Nelson and other places because of virtual care. Sort of the unintended support that we get from COVID is this ability to work um, virtually. So we're hoping to stretch that into something where no person in BC doesn't have access to grief and bereavement support. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ben. Uh, thanks, Donna. Um, um, I guess the question, you, you mentioned about the, I don't know if the revelation or discovery during COVID about uh, things that were um, facing people that are using the services. Could you elaborate a little bit more about what is it that ha uh, happened and, and how has that impacted people? Just to get a better understanding, is this a temporary or longer term? Um, I believe we've probably opened the doors to something longer term, but what we found is due to the isolation, due, due to the lack of people being able to get together to grieve, to go through um, celebrations of life or funerals, people were left with their grief unattended to and no way of community supporting them. And so that's why we found that there was an increased reach out. And also with that, we've also found an increased reach of people wanting to know how to care for people that are grieving. So even within in this time we're looking at how do we develop programs that support maybe teachers in the school that can help children that are grieving so that they have the tools and the words and the things to, to say to these kids as they move forward in their grief. So what it's done is I don't think we there are more um, people grieving. I think it's lifted the lid off what the needs are for people so that uh, they've been looking for places for support. Thanks very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. I can't think of how many people I know that have gone through that in the last, you know, almost 20 months. So, Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, uh, I'm not seeing anyone else indicating that they'd like to ask a question. Uh, so, Donna, on behalf of the uh, committee, I would really like to thank you uh, for coming here and uh, making the presentation, but also thank you uh, for the work that you're leading. Uh, as you were speaking, I, I was thinking, I think all of us uh, have, have, have had to figure it out for ourselves at, at different points in our lives of how to cope with our own grief. And um, the concept of unresolved grief and uh, in the implications of that is very powerful. Uh, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity to share our work. Thank you. And our next presenter is Todd Corrigal, uh, Prince George Chamber of Commerce. So, Todd, you have five minutes to make a presentation. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we're using our phone to time it. Um, uh, we will signal to you when you have 30 seconds left so that you can wrap it up. And, uh, and then we budget about um, five minutes for questions. Perfect. So whenever you're ready. Good to come off? Absolutely. Thank you. It's kind of nice coming in after Donna, who's one of my board members, uh, but we also accessed her services uh, almost a year to the day, and they are a great organization here in our community. Uh, so thank you so much for allowing us another opportunity to present to you today uh, on behalf of the Prince George Chamber of Commerce and our community. What we'd like to talk to you about today was something that was distributed uh, to you, I believe, about a week ago, which is a letter to the Premier and a, a number of the Cabinet Ministers regarding the mental health and addictions crisis that's currently plaguing communities throughout BC, uh, and something that's certainly not unique to Prince George, uh, but we will speak to the Prince George issues. Uh, the, the issue of mental health and addictions has not only increased, uh, but broadened uh, through the pandemic. So when we look at 
economic recovery uh, as a whole, which I think by and large is what people think will speak specifically to, uh, it has become challenging. Our business districts have been uh, overrun uh, with homeless populations. A large number we suspect are heavily mental, uh, mentally ill or mentally ill as a result of their addictions. This has become greatly challenging as small businesses are trying to find their path forward uh, and they're constantly met uh, with drug paraphernalia, human feces, uh, persons at risk uh, in their doorways, uh, vandalizing their property and tormenting staff. What we do appreciate and understand is this is an issue that needs to be addressed at its core. Uh, and that is finding out what are the issues that are plaguing these individuals and how do we find a joint path forward. Uh, there's certainly a number of people uh, that get quite angry at this system and at the process. Uh, and while we can appreciate the anger and the frustration, we understand that we still don't fully comprehend and understand what the root cause of those problems are. Within our letter, we've identified a few areas of concern. Uh, as we note, uh, the four pillars approach introduced by now Senator Campbell uh, a number of years ago was really driven to not only tactically helping the problems uh, and, and stopping the spread of communicable disease through the sharing of, of drug paraphernalia, it was also finding treatment and resources to help that process move forward. Uh, that is something we believe quite strongly in. And as we head towards a strong dialogue around safe supply, uh, as, as instructed by the PHO, we see that as a unique opportunity to really drive some information forward, to understand what root cause looks like, to understand where the mental illness stems from. Uh, we do know this largely impacts uh, our First Nations community to a much higher degree than it does other parts of our community. Our concerns currently are that uh, Minister Malcolmson, uh, the Minister for Mental Health and Addictions, has truly got an unfunded ministry. She's able to afford her staff but doesn't have the necessary financial resources to dive into these challenges. And without that appropriate funding, it's a ministry that is out to sea without a sail. Uh, so we are, are, are greatly concerned with that. Uh, and strongly suggesting that that ministry receive the necessary funding to tackle some of these issues and be a true partner. As noted from the uh, response from the Premier's office, uh, they have passed this to, uh, to Minister Malcolmson's uh, attention. She was CC'd uh, on the original note. We have not heard back. We understand it's a challenging time with UBCM and, and the ongoing pandemic, uh, but we do hope that that dialogue will open up. Additionally, the burden of this has been passed on to municipalities throughout BC. Uh, that becomes another financial burden downloaded to municipalities, which is quite challenging and something that we would like to see work towards. Through that, what we're suggesting is that WorkSafe BC be used as a catalyst organization to help with training programs and initiatives to train municipal staff not only how to handle these materials appropriately, but how to work appropriately with the at-risk population uh, so that they're being compassionate in the situation uh, that personal effects and property are dealt with appropriately. But because this truly is a work-based challenge and, and creating safe spaces for the workers, uh, we see this as a, as a great opportunity for WorkSafe BC to be the catalyst. With that, I, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Todd. Um, I'll um, uh, now ask committee members um, for their questions. I guess it's early. <laughs> it's your group. I wanted to ask a question, right? Good morning, everyone. So, um, <clears throat> and thanks, Todd, for um, you know, it's uh, kind of uh, yeah, you're raising uh, an important issue, and uh, particularly from a chamber of commerce perspective, uh, it is uh, very important because uh, you know, in opening new businesses and you know, uh, operation of a. Uh, Small business always challenge uh, under those circumstances. So, um, what I want to ask you, other than apart from that, there's a lack of money in the ministry uh, uh, in the rural area, like uh, small town, like Prince George, Prince George, and others. Uh, do you see uh, uh, any different set of needs as compared to you know lower mainland? Uh, you know that there's something different has to be designed or worked out? Yeah, thank you for that question, MLA Brar. That That is a great question. And I think the, the, the similarities between the problem are not exclusive. The, the issues plaguing 
the at-risk populations which are translating to challenges on the doorsteps of small business are exactly the same. It's mental health, it's addictions, uh, it's uh, a, a lack of housing options that uh, provide that, that, that opportunity to move forward. Uh, so while the climate <laughs> may be different between uh, the lower mainland and, and northern and central BC, the issue itself is quite similar. However, with those uh, uh, geographical issues that play into it, uh, inclement weather, uh, cold, uh, that does elevate some of those concerns, certainly. As we can see from the weather today, it's, it's cool and it's damp. Uh, and not to say the lower mainland isn't cool and damp at the best of times. Uh, we'll get to minus 40, uh, and it will snow, and people will die outdoors. So what is, if you can expand on that, uh, you are uh, particularly pointing out to the safe supply, it's not working, like, uh, can you elaborate on that? Certainly. Uh, so while I understand the concept of safe supply at its core, we're trying to create uh, a, a, a drug that is clean and is not going to uh, force an overdose or kill somebody on the spot in the minute. That's tremendous. What it isn't doing is helping us better understand what the underlying issues are so that we can move towards a four pillars approach or at minimum some type of treatment option. So having safe supply truly is this catalyst opportunity that I think we've been waiting for to better understand root cause for mental health and mental health caused addictions. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Todd. Um, it, it's always nice to hear the, the term around four pillars just instead of one pillar. Uh, that seemed to have been the problem in the past. Um, I'm very intrigued by your link to WorkSafe BC becoming the trainers. I, want, I would really like to know how you leapt to that. How we leapt to that is the historical overfunding uh, and business payments that have gone to WorkSafe BC. So we know that there was a tremendous amount of money that was spent by businesses into the WorkSafe BC process. Their ultimate role uh, is creating safe spaces for workers in BC, which we 100% appreciate. Safe spaces uh, for workers in my opinion, extends beyond uh, the four brick walls that might be the confines of your workplace. If we have municipal employees, parks employees, uh, um, uh, outdoor workers who are forced to uh, clean up encampments, <clears throat> excuse me, move encampments along or, or deal with drug paraphernalia, that m can and does result in a very unsafe work environment for them, uh, which is where we come to the place of WorkSafe BC being a product that gets utilized. Um, uh, thank you. Can you uh, tell me how far you've gotten with this idea uh, within, you know, I mean, it's a great idea. I'd just like to know how, how far it's been nudged. Yeah. So uh, uh, August 18th was the initial letter to Premier and a number of Cabinet Ministers. Uh, the response was received on August 26th, which we were greatly encouraged by to see such a quick and, and positive response and the, and the item being referred. Uh, but we have not heard back at that point. Uh, so we're, we're, we're waiting for Minister Malcolmson or her office to engage us in that discussion. Uh, so how far down the road we are. Uh, in November of 2019, the Prince George Chamber of Commerce created a community meeting where we invited businesses to attend back when we could, uh, a large gathering of people for an open sharing of ideas which we uh, were able to capture some thoughts from. Uh, we captured those ideas, provided some policy recommendations through the BC Chamber to our federal partners, uh, as well to the municipal government. Uh, from there, uh, the city uh, was somewhat forced into a position of creating the, uh, uh, the Safe, Clean and Inclusive Community Task Force, which was another opportunity for us to engage these discussions. Uh, and we have pushed policy through the BC Chamber every year since then. So on the letter specifically, we are approximately a month and a half down the road. On the process, we've started this in, uh, in November of 2019. Great, thank you. And a final question uh, from Ben. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Todd. And uh, you know, there's something about the North, and I say that having been not a Northerner, but lived in the North for a number of years and uh, having worked here. And I do think that the problems uh, when we look at rural British Columbia, uh, are very different than in urban British Columbia. And I think about the, uh, I'm wondering if you could just uh, maybe 
tell us a little bit about uh, what Baldy Hughes, which is an alcohol treatment facility uh, nearby, has done for your community from that point of view and kind of how that might translate if there was proper mental health. Have you got a comparison or uh, something that... We've got more anecdotal information. You know, our, our engagement with Baldy Hughes is is quite high level uh, because of the privacy that's in place, but we want to understand what success looks like. Uh, and, you know, one of the policies we put forward, I believe, two years ago was having uh, government properties that are unused or underutilized since taxpayers already own these facilities uh, retrofitted into treatment facilities similar to the Baldy Hughes model. Uh, that way that we're, we're able to have a place, a safe space for people to recover, uh, for people who want to be with their partners or family who are in recovery uh, could go. So, for example, uh, the Prince George Youth Detention Center uh, is an area in town which I believe currently has two or three active users in it, but could hold you know, probably 100 recovery beds. Uh, so Baldy Hughes being close to town, but a little bit out, only welcoming men, uh, really sort of shortens the number. So the Baldy Hughes model has been highly successful. We've seen good numbers of recovery rates. Uh, there's even a gentleman who works there currently who uh, is a recovering addict uh, and speaks quite passionately about his experiences at Baldy Hughes and why he currently works there. I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more of that for all genders, for all races, uh, and really open that up for our communities. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Todd. Well, um, on that note, um, uh, we'll conclude uh, this part of the presentation. On behalf of the committee, um, I'd like to thank you, Todd, for coming and uh, making a presentation. And I, I also like to say that I'm, I'm struck by um, uh, the compassion with which um, you have uh, stated what you want to see happen. Uh, an issue that often um, is conveyed to us um, as, a, as an inconvenience to businesses. And I'm, I'm really struck by the fact that you've taken it beyond that. I think that it's a, frame of, a way of framing it that leads more likely to solutions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And our next presenter is Candace Johnson, Supported uh, Child Development. So Candace, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we're keeping track with our phones. Um, when you have about, uh, when you have 30 seconds, um, uh, Jennifer will hold that up so you know it's time to wrap up. And, uh, and then we'll have about five minutes for questions as well. Um, so my name is Candace Johnson. I'm a support child development consultant at the Prince George Child Development Centre. Um, the Child Development Centre is located on the unceded ter stolen territory of the Clay Lake Tene Nation, um, which is now colonial, known of course as Prince George. Um, at the Child Development Centre, we are definitely dedicated in order to um, looking at the calls to action, so that's just why we included an acknowledgement. Uh, the Child Development Centre provides services to a wide range of children with diverse abilities. We have mental health services as well as behavioural challenges. The Prince George Child Development Centre provides services to over 1,000 children per year, and the CDC provides a multidisciplinary therapy and integrated services such as speech therapy, physiotherapy, and occupational therapy. What I'm here to speak to you today about is supported child development. Supported child development consultants and support staff are critical members of the early intervention team. Supported child development helps provide inclusion for children to be able to attend childcare programs within the community. CDC services are essential to enable children with diverse abilities to participate in childcare and preschool programs as well as make successful transitions into the K-12 system. Unfortunately, there are too many children that never make it off our wait lists before this critical phase is finished, making the transition to school even more challenging. Traditionally, CDCs have focused on addressing physical and behavioral needs for children with disabilities, but we also are now finding that behavioral, social, and emotional and psychological supports are also needed for these children and families. Children with disabilities do not receive, if children with disabilities do not receive the necessary services, they were less likely to be in, successful in school. Less, they, are more, yeah, they require more ongoing services from MCFD, healthcare, and the education system. The human and economic costs of failing to provide CDC services to children with disabilities is staggering. The BC Association of Child Development Centre and Interventions have noticed that there has been no provincial funding increases to early intervention therapists, therapies from 2008 to 2016. 
In 2016, the program received a small increase, although the budget consultation reports for 2018, 19, and 20 made specific recommendations to increase investment in early intervention services. As a result, early intervention therapies continue to have the longest wait times province-wide. The Select Standing Committee on Finance for the 2021 report also noted the importance of early intervention services by recommendation 112 of their report states, providing funding to the Ministry of Children and Family Development helps reduce wait times to improve access to assessment, assessments, early intervention therapies, early child education, infant development programs, health and medical systems, and home support services for before and after school care programs. Investments made in child care presently by the NDP government will be saving families up to $19,000 per year, and the 10-year child care plan is bringing universal child care to British Columbia. As an early child educator, I welcome the $10 a day child care plan. It's something that we've been fighting for a long period of time. I applaud the current government and their child care plan. Unfortunately, there are children with diversities that continue to fall through the system cracks. We need to continue to reduce barriers that, that COVID has highlighted. Not only is childcare an issue for parents with children with challenges, but even if they find a space, they may be unable to take that space due to not having a support staff. The waitlist numbers only reflect those children that have been referred. Many families choose not to put their children onto a waitlist due to the fact that they know that their children will not receive services. The SCD support systems this year started with 17 support staff here in Prince George providing supports to 46 children in 22 early child education programs. We are providing, there's currently 117 children on our wait list to receive services. SCD consultants are also planning ways of addressing wait lists by doing small groups with occupational therapists and speech therapists in order to help address the children's needs that are on wait lists in order to provide, provide them with the ability to be able to go into programs possibly without support. In comparison to 2020 and 2021, we continue to see referrals grow. In April 2020, we had 78 children. In April 2021, we had 92 children. In August of 2020, we had 82 children and now, August 2020, 117 children. What we would like to see in the EC community is in order to actually build capacity in order to have early child education jobs uh, receive the support staff jobs to receive the ECE incentive program, which is an amazing program that's been facilitated for early child education. Um, currently, the support staff are not able to do that. Recruitment and retention is an issue here in Prince George as well. So we'd like to be able to see advanced seats in advanced education in order to provide more online resources through the College of New Caledonia, as well as being able to address recruitment and retention issues by um, ensuring that children, all children have access to childcare. It's, possible, it's, it's impossible to solve this puzzle of childcare without involving supported child development. All of these children have the right to child care just as their typical developing peers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Candace. Uh, I'll uh, now invite members of the committee to ask uh, you some questions. Lauren. Thanks, Candace. I, I know uh, how large this problem is. Uh, I'm from Williams Lake, and I know that our uh, child development center is incredible, but they work with, with uh, a very limited budget. Um, can I get a sense of when the wait list started? You, you mentioned funding. Uh, the last funding increase was in 2016. And it was a very small funding a, increase of one, maybe one position. Okay, so one position. When did wait lists start? I would say wait lists have started since the very beginning of supported child development um, due to the fact that when block funding was changed from the way that it was supported to child development centers, when block funding was made, and rightfully so, in order to give parent choice, um, wait lists started because when you're moving children into communities, um, prior block funding allowed children to attend one program and we would have maybe one or two educators with you know, a large group of children. But whereas we have parent choice, you're able to go to all these different childcare programs. So now the, the wait lists have definitely increased from there. Our wait lists have increased, I cannot even imagine, like, it's, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And one of the other 
struggles that I know that other facilities are having are pay equality. Are, are your staff unionized or not? Our staff are unionized, although, like I said, they are una they're unable to get the EC wage enha enhancement, which other early child education programs are able to. So for us, recruitment and retention is quite difficult, even though they do make a, f a, a good wage. Um, and have benefits, we're unable to compete now with early child education programs, whereas they're, when they're able to get the $2 and $4 an hour enhancement. Right, of course. Thank you. If you find anybody. Right. I understand. <laughs> Completely. Your group. Thank you, Candice, for uh, coming today and also for the exceptional services you're providing, providing to very vulnerable, uh, you know, children. Uh, I just want to ask you, I know the um, $10 a day child care is uh, one program that's a, uh, of course, uh, you know, we're moving forward on that one. Uh, uh, but you're talking about uh, different uh, children who have very different needs. Uh, can you tell us as to, like, what percentage of children fall into that category, if, if that's possible? And also, uh, it, may, it may sound simple to you, support of child development. It may not be simple to us what it means. Mm -hmm. If you can elaborate that a little bit more to us as to what, what you're talking about. So support of child development, um, myself as a consultant, we provide consultation to child care programs in order to help provide inclusion for children with challenges and special needs to be able to attend. We also have 17 support staff that can go to different child care programs in order to provide the one-on-one -on -one support. So it's kind of like what you would see in an EA system in the school district is exactly what we're doing but in child care programs. Um, as for the number of children, we service, like I said, we service over 1,000 children right now at the Child Development Center, so I wouldn't be able to give you the percentage. That's something that I'm unsure of, just due to the fact of we don't know even the children that are attending that um, haven't referred to support child development. But like I said, we continue, our, our referrals continue to grow every year, um, and it is important. This is, this is the early years. This is what actually the foundation and how important this is for them. Thank you. Ben. Uh, thanks, Candace. It's, uh, you know, it's always uh, uh, heart-wrenching to hear about these challenges and having met with parents on, you know, the side of, you know, getting the services. I guess the question is, is um, the government changed the way that the funding model worked from going to the child development centers to an individual pearl per child individual because the parents were saying that they weren't getting the services they needed. It seems to me that, you know, by addressing that, you know, we're kind of not satisfying either side. Mm -hmm. How do we get the two sides? Because I, it, it appears to me that there is more diagnosis and other issues that come, uh, you know, I mean, autism and all of the different interventions and stuff like that. And I guess I'm just trying to say is how do we get this so that it's working for parents and children and the people that are providing the services? Because, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to me that, uh, I mean, I've seen them in my own community where uh, services have been discontinued or cut because they couldn't afford to do it and mostly because they couldn't fund the staff. So what do we have to do to fix this? I wish I had a magic answer for that. Um, we used to, at the Child Development Center, we did have early child education programs um, and we were able to provide that. But again, due to funding cuts and funding cuts and ongoing um, just cuts to the, to the, from the, the Ministry of Children and Families, we weren't able to sustain that. Um, in a short answer, if you tripled our budget, we could probably provide more services. <laughs> um, but I will, I mean, I hate to say that money is the answer, but it truly is. Money, that foundation at the bottom, like right when the children are starting, saves so much money moving into the future. Like it, it stops health care costs, it cuts more costs from child and families, it cuts less for the case system. We know that the case system is overran with children right now and being able to actually support to early, with early child education or with assistance in the programs. If we actually are able to help put the money into that foundation, we will be able to make a difference. And I think that there are more children now being diagnosed just due to the fact that we have more awareness. We have more abilities to know that. Parents are now seeing um, that those services are available for their children. And I wouldn't want it to, I wouldn't want it to go back the other way, honestly, because I really think that parent choice is very important. Well, thank you, Candice. Um, we are now, um, we're out of time. Thank you. Uh, but it's a very important topic. Um, I wrote down um, the human and economic costs 
mm-hmm. of, uh, of not addressing this um, er, at the early stages. And I've been reflecting on uh, the implications. Thank you uh, very for, much. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. So next we'll go to uh, Gail Wallen, Invasive Species Council of BC. So you have five minutes, uh, Gail. Um, we'll give you a signal when you've got about when you've got thirty seconds to wrap up. Okay. Good. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm with the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia, which is the largest. A nonprofit on invasive species in Canada. And I just want to recognize that BC, including BC's government, is actually leaders in Canada on invasive species. So I'm here today. I know you've already had a number of presentations on invasive species environmental issues. I'm going to follow up on that, but I've got to give you guys a marathon. You guys go through so many of those. Well done. I listened to a bunch of them and I was going, wow, you guys got get a marathon badge for that. Um, So first of all, I want to reset invasive species because actually what we're really concerned about is our healthy environment, which is really important for us for clean water, clean air, um, and actually particularly with COVID, going be able to go outside. That's what we're working for. Invasive species are the second biggest threat to that those healthy environments, and with climate change coming up and growing, it actually exasperates the impact of, of invasive species and the threat. So when we take a look at extreme weather events, whether there's floods in many areas or fires, invasive species can actually make those much worse. So it's actually really important, just like with forest fires, to be ahead of the game rather than trying to fight it afterwards. Um, uh, when I take a look at sort of, we consider invasive species like an environmental pollution. They're not all the species. We had a lot of species here, roses and uh, crocuses. Those are fine. It's the few number that come without their predators that can take over our environment and then causes millions annually and environmental damage like species at risk. So we need to avoid that devastation. And the first thing you need to do is close the pathways, close how they're coming in and being spread. Uh, so you, and we can all relate to that as we're wearing masks today. Um, so we need to close the spread. We take a look at many of the 70, 60, 70 percent of our invasive species are introduced often intentionally, whether it's garden plants, scotch broom for you guys on the island. Those are just really simple examples. Um, we need to prevent. We need to prevent them coming in. We need to take some action. I've got four actions I want to call on. Um, one of them is we need to protect our green infrastructure. And we know that nationally. We know that Canada is in negotiation with BC. We know that BC cares about our environment. If we don't protect that green infrastructure, which whether it's grasslands to fo- support our food supply or species at risk, whether it's dealing with forests, which are carbon storage, which are threatened by forest pests, all of those are a greater threat with climate change. And those are all absolutely vital for mitigating temperatures in cities, mitigating uh, soil, uh, carbon storage, et cetera. So protecting our green infrastructure has got to be paramount. How do we do that? Um, right now, and I know you've already had this, but we need to increase the annual funding to at least $15 million, And that's having worked with government folks where our current funding is in British Columbia. I'm not calling for our council. I'm calling, calling on behalf of the province and uh, provincial interests. And so calling for 15 million investment rather than five, six, seven is gonna put you ahead and give you a better chance to be ahead of that forest fire, rather that silent forest fire, rather than trying to fight, out, fight it uh, behind it. And it needs to be continual. So it can't be just year end, here's a bonus money, because you actually, for invasive species, have to have multi-year approaches. You can't get rid of uh, mussels. You can't get rid of knapweed by just a one year and then 10 years off. So it needs that. Um, one of the things about stable funding that is ideal right now is it's everyone in this room, whether you're rural, urban, or indigenous, there's a relationship between you and urban, uh, between you and invasive species. Indigenous uh, communities are much more aware now of the impact on traditional food and, and traditional plants and food supplies, and they want jobs. Many of them want jobs. Those are so we can involve, we can create jobs. Ranchers, people that care, are stewards of our land. They care because it's in, in, impacting the quality of life. So actually, by having increased funding, like we're currently running a funding program now to create jobs for people in rural and remote parts of BC because jobs are needed. So invasive species, as 
awesome because it can touch every person in British Columbia. That's not a good thing, but it actually is a reality. So uh, it involves so in, solutions for invasive species, more money, involve citizens, and create jobs, which lines up with your mandate. There's an invasive species trust fund that was called for in all three invasive plant species strategies in British Columbia, which have been released by three different forest and environment ministers, and they all call for an um, external in, uh, invasive species trust fund to enable those fast emergency responses when required. The last action is regulation. We have so many species that are not regulated that are sold or traded, so we can't, you know, we can't eradicate them and then have somebody else planting them. So we need to have stronger regulations that's enforced. So I just want to close by saying thanks again for the opportunity. Leadership is needed. BC is already a leader. We need to do more, and we need to be able to take a leadership ahead, just like a new approach for fires. We need a new approach for invasive species. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gail. Uh, I'll ask for questions uh, from the committee. Lauren. <clears throat> Thanks, Gail, for the presentation. You, um, you touched on forest fires, and, and this uh, I've had the opportunity to tour a number of areas of forest fire. And uh, at Pressy Lake in the South Caribou, I can tell you that for as far as the eye can see, it is paintbrush. And um, I don't see a lot else growing there. What can we do to mitigate this? I mean, the, the uh, ranchers would suggest that if we threw three pounds of uh, grass seed from helicopters over every acre, it would help. Uh, but we seem to be doing nothing about it. And I, the, the Chilcotin also has been devastated by weeds uh, since the 2017 fires. So, so fires are actually, so there's lots that we can do proactively. First of all, equipment coming in, like in the states, are often regulated for where you draw your water from. Let's not draw water from a mussel-infested lake and take it to another area. We can also make sure our equipment's clean coming in, and those are standards that are elsewhere. Once you've had a fire, you're right. Proactive action is important. It's a big discussion whether it should be hydro, plain seeded or different seeding methods, but you need to also have clean seed. Many areas have been, have been replanted after fires, but they have contaminants in the seed mixes, so that has to be addressed. The other thing is when, you, when you've got disturbed soil any place, particularly after fires, you need to get it revegetated, and seed, clean seed is one of the best ways. Perfect time to create jobs, perfect time to re restore an area. Don't, let's not leave it destroyed, open. You it's said, a huge issue. You said $15 million increasing to that from five or six. What, what happens with that money? So for, government's got to be staffed internally, but you also need a match externally like with many of the stewards, the ranchers, the indigenous communities, groups like ourselves, because we leverage other funding to come in. Like all the steward groups that are out there in BC can make a difference. You can't do it within government. You can do some within government, not all of it. So it needs to go into absolutely prevention first. Let's stop the new Asian giant hornet from getting established. Let's stop the new feral pig population from getting established because otherwise you're chasing them like you are broom on the island forever. Thank you. Megan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I have heard a little bit about uh, the Invasive Species Council of BC through LEPS and other organizations mm -hmm. in, in Langley. What I'm wondering is it's becoming a, a larger and larger challenge. You know, myself, I'm a farmer. What sort of initiatives are taking place? You mentioned cattle ranchers and so on um, moving forward and sort of specifically with the $15 million of stable funding, where do you see that sort of going in, in sort of the food areas? For, the food areas? Yeah. So again, prevention is going to be your first story. So we need to have more inspections coming in so that there's less contaminants. There's lots of restrictions, uh, international restrictions, but we need to have more inspections coming in so that the food industry isn't impacted. And then they need to be acted on more quickly, like following spotted Sofla for the food industry, you know, for years afterwards, when the Sunshine Coast has been calling, let's keep it out of our region. And so we need to set up those regional boundaries so you don't spread one invasive insect from one part of the province to the other. Soil movement in the, in the food industry is a huge issue because soil is where you move many of your invasive species, and not just plants, but many of the insects like fire ants, if you haven't heard about those, those have really impacted a lot of the, of the agriculture industry, and it's yes. simply by movement of soil. So dollars need to go into partnerships with organizations such as BC uh, Landscape Nursery Association or, or food production, groups like ourselves and our partners because together we can make a difference. The Japanese Beetle Initiative in Vancouver, downtown Vancouver, it has four different levels of government and it has community and industry working together 
that's a model in Canada. That's what we need to do more of. It's not just one off and you do something different. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not seeing. Did you have a question? Just, just. Um, thanks. I didn't very touch much. aquatics for you. Sorry. <laughs> no. Well, you did. You mentioned mussels. Thanks, Gail. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but I really, you touched on with Lauren's question about forest fires in this, and. Uh, I guess the question is, considering the, the forest fire damage we've had in the last four or five years, um, how plugged in is the Evasive Species Council with uh, BC Wildfire, like this restoration and what's going on? It, it, do, you have, do you feel like you have good input into the reconstruction of the uh, forest as part of what you do? So we've got some communication and more meetings coming up absolutely could be more one of the calls that has been happening on forest fires is to have and this is not new to you guys more local decision making rather than provincial making because the fires out in the Chilcotin have certain concerns that are different than the ones down even in Elephant Hill so um, two calls one is when people aren't working back in the early spring they can be doing more on invasive species control so that's recommendation we've carried forward to the fire department or the while uh, forest well, fire. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is proactively going in immediately to deal with the, the open roads and disturbances that uh, uh, Minister uh, Dirksen had re referred to. So that's important. But remember, many invasive species are actually fuel. So things like scotch bream, highly flammable. So if we're talking about community fire smarting, you need to get rid of these invasive species and get rid of some of the new ones because they're actually exasperating the fire. Okay. Thanks, Gail. Okay, with that, uh, Gail, uh, we'll, uh, um, uh, we'll thank you for your presentation and for fielding uh, the questions. I think we're all becoming much more aware of, uh, of the impact of invasive uh, species and uh, far less uh, likely to just think it's something we have to just shrug off. We and thank you for proposing um, very concrete solutions. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Thank you to all of you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. And our next presenter is George Davidson, who is um, uh, representing the Faculty Association of the College of New Caledonia. So George, you have five minutes. And uh, we'll give you a signal when you have 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay, this uh, might go a touch longer than that, but uh, rehearsals are always different than live. No so thanks for uh, uh, allowing us to be here. We represent, we, uh, my partner, uh, the president of the Faculty Association, the college, Bill Deutsch, has just stepped out for a doctor's call. It was time to, right in the middle of this. We represent the Faculty Association at the College of New Caledonia on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Kalei Litana Nation. There are 21 other First Nations in the college region. Thanks for this opportunity. We are Local 3 of the Federation of Post-Secondary Educators, and we fully endorse the recommendations the Federation made to your committee back in late August. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to repeat those. Instead, I'm going to focus on local concerns, some longstanding, some that have arisen as the college has faced the COVID pandemic. We've long advocated for the elimination of the secondary scale at CNC. It's been in place since 1986, four years before I got to the college. But it now means that part-time faculty are paid 75% less than their full-time colleagues for doing the same work. I've been working on trying to address this since I got involved in the Faculty Association back in 1992. And despite a letter in the last round of bargaining to allocate some funding to partially reduce this inequity, we've seen little movement from the college to address this long-standing issue. Another one has been the, the institution's accumulation of surplus. CNC alone has increased its operating surplus from $13.4 million in 2015 to $23.8 million, adding $1.5 million in the last year alone. Provincially, the 20 post-secondary institutions under the auspices of PSEA, uh, uh, Post-Sector Employers Association, have a combined $1.13 billion in surpluses on their books, almost double the amount posted 10 years ago. While some of these funds encompass scholarship and bursary dollars, not all do. The system would be much better off if these dollars were used to create equitable working conditions for faculty, improve learning conditions for students, meet the programming needs of the communities within the college region. 
and the practice of including institutional surpluses in the province's consolidated revenue means that these funds cannot be used as they should be used for students, not to offset the provincial debt. Similarly, the trend to administrative bloat has con continued unabated. CNC has 70 excluded employees. 20 years ago, when the college was much larger, there were 40. Their total compensation has increased from $2.8 million to $6.9 million in the same period. Provincially, again in the PSEA orbit, last year there were 1,723 excluded uh, employees versus 909 in 2000. Their combined pay has increased from $67.8 million to just over $215.6 million. 90% more administrators, 317% more pay. And to make matters worse, performance bonuses have just been introduced into the system. Direct government funding to institutions has also declined relative to inflation over the years, and student tuition revenues have increased dramatically. When I started in the 1990s, CNC got 85% of its funding from government, with tuition making up about 10%. The government grant last year was 50% of revenues. Student tuition was 31%. Ten years ago, CNC took in about $10 million a year in tuition. Last year, it was $24.4 million coming from students. This is partly because the 2% cap on domestic tuition has been meaningless. Institutions have found all sorts of creative ways to get around tuition caps. And secondly, because international fees are completely unregulated. When CNC is paying over a million dollars a year to recruiting agents, another completely unregulated field, there's a problem. It also means that CNC isn't delivering on its regional mandate, underserving the people in its region in favor of recruiting students from all over the world because they pay more tuition. Pandemic problems locally started with the almost overnight shift to online education. This was done in violation of the local collective agreement, which calls for a release in developing online courses. Language has been there for 20 years. Faculty did this because they had to, but the college's refusal to entertain some compensation for this added to a huge workload for all faculty and is now part of, part of several labor board complaints uh, to, uh, to the board. Despite the pandemic, many faculty continued to face-to-face -to -face instruction, particularly in the trades and health sciences. We we're fortunate that there was only one COVID outbreak, but it took the inter intervention of WorkSafe PC to deal with it. We've seen a significant rise in grievances in the past year. We've also seen layoffs, despite the fact that there isn't a funding problem and there isn't really a student uh, enrollment problem. To wrap up, I'll say that CNC is not a happy workplace anymore. The cuts of the last 15 years have taken their toll. Once a comprehensive community college serving a vast region in the central interior, 50% of our students are now international. The sense of community that existed, such as it was, was shattered by the move to online courses. It'll take time to rebuild that community. In the meantime, government can act to support faculty and students, curb the rise of the managerial culture, and promote access to affordable and comprehensive programs that serve British Columbians. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, now I'll invite uh, uh, members of the committee to um, pursue any line of questioning. Megan. Thank you for your presentation. I have. Uh, a quick question. Will you be putting in a written submission too? I can do that, yes. Thank you. Uh, the second thing is, this year, are you 100% back in class or are you partially online still? Uh, mostly in class. Some online still exists. Okay. Do you see that returning fully to in person? At some point, but It's hard to say. It's it, you know, it's up to the pandemic, uh, and it's up to uh, the health authorities, and it's up to the ministry. Uh, the college has very little control over who's in the classrooms anymore. Okay, so it's it's because of the health orders, not just yeah. sort of a. Sh you don't see a shift no. in, in your university sort of environment no. going no. To partially online. Okay, that's where I was going with that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, your group. Yeah, thanks, George. Once again, uh, you've raised uh, very important uh, issues. Uh, uh, whether it's uh, 
surplus of 1.13 billion dollars, or performance bonuses, or um, fee increases, or uh, you know number of students you have, uh, international students you have in the in the in the, in the college. Um, moving forward, I would like to ask you, like, what kind of solutions you suggest? <laughs> That's a good question, and. Uh, uh, I just retired at the end of August, so uh, I'm, I've been made an honorary member, a life member of the Faculty Association, so it's in that capacity that I'm here. I was a former president of FPSE and of the National Union of, of CAUT, so I've thought about this for a long time. Uh, I think there needs to, well, there is a funding review going on. I'm, a, I'm aware of that. The funding system has been broken for decades, so uh, it needs to be fixed. The uh, there's no regulation of international fees. There should be some regulation of international fees. Colleges and universities shouldn't be able to charge whatever they want for this to make up declining government funding, and that's where it comes in. 85% then, some institutions are under 30% government funding, and their revenues are made up largely by tuition. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, you know, I haven't even talked about student debt. There's a huge problem there. So, uh, you know, reducing or eliminating the interest uh, uh, fees on loans is a little bit, but it does nothing to, uh, for the massive debt that students are incurring now and that they will be carrying forward into their marrying years and, and their careers. So that's a problem and it needs to be addressed. And only the government can do that. Right? It's not something yeah. that we can do as a small faculty association in the middle of BC. So a couple of quick questions, keep in mind the time. The, um, you, you mentioned $1.13 billion surplus. This is PSA members. Yes. Uh, the, uh, like, do we as a government have any control on that or uh, this? Yes, the institutions, uh, I think there was some allocation last year for institutions that, uh, that were in trouble because of lack of students, and they were allowed to dip into those surpluses. But any dipping into those surpluses has to be accounted for in the provincial debt. So the province doesn't want the debt to go up, so uh, using those funds, in effect, does that. It was a change the Liberals made sometime in the mid-2000s. Uh, institutions complained about it at the time. I haven't heard much lately. But, you know, these funds have been uh, incurred by charging students and, you know, uh, underpaying part-time faculty uh, and the rest of us, I guess. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a problem. So uh, institutions do not have the ability to use the funds that are there. Thank you, George. Ben. Uh, thanks very much, George. Um, you made a statement uh, just at the end of your presentation that 50% of the school student population was international. Yes. Where did you get that information? Because From the preceding president of the institution. So is that, is that something, uh, because there is a cap. There's no cap, cap on international students anywhere. Okay. Well, then there's a set of goalposts because I know at UBC and many of these other institutions, the, uh, the cap is kind of around 25% or less. Yes, and I've heard that in the past, but it's, a, um, you know, places like UNBC, it's aspirational because they don't have 20%. At places like CNC, uh, you know, we've gone from a trickle of international students 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. to, uh, to 1,500 international students just before the pandemic hit. All of these numbers are usually about a year, a year and a half out of date. It's just the way numbers are counted. But, uh, you know, uh, the college is funded for 3,500 students, perhaps, uh, more trade students now than university transfer students, uh, where I was for many years. Uh, but it's, it has, uh, it's like 60% of its funded FTEs, because international students aren't counted on that. So in order to make up the, the lack of funding for the traditional programs, uh, international students have come in. And the college a couple of years ago was paying a million dollars a year to recruiting agents to get students here from South Asia and, uh, uh, and the Middle East. Okay, thanks. And this is a small college. It's not Langara. Well, George, we're out of time, uh, but we want to thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for your passionate advocacy and for um, raising some issues uh, that um, 
uh, we need to take into consideration in terms of going uh, going forward. Um, uh, an institution like this plays an important role in economic recovery, and they have to be part of that. So, Thank and you, enjoy Rick. your retirement. <laughs> Thank you. Renovating houses right now. So <laughs> it doesn't seem like retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our um, next presenter is Re Rebecca Bachel, uh, uh, Literacy Quinell Society. Hi, thank you. That was interesting. I am one of those underpaid part-time faculty members at the college in my other job. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to be here today. My name is Rebecca Boyshall. For the past 21 years, I've worked in community literacy here in BC. Um, I'm currently the Executive Director with Literacy Quenell Society, which is a non-profit organisation situated on the unceded and traditional territory of the Lataco Dene Nation. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you all in person, um, seems like a rare treat these days, about the importance of literacy. And I really appreciate that you've invited people from community organisations to speak to you about all kinds of issues. It's a really good example of good governance. Um, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Training, the Provincial Literacy Organisation, DECODA, Literacy Solutions, and groups like ours work together to provide community-based literacy programs and services. These programs support people of all ages who are often not served in other ways. Many people associate literacy work with traditional images of education, but after the per past two decades of working in this area, I've seen firsthand that traditional, typical examples of educational settings and expectations don't work for everyone. We have a unique system here in BC in that we have literacy outreach coordinators to do the work um, in over 400 communities across BC. So the LOCs, as we call them, do the work that fits their community. So we have programs that look different from other programs, but that all hold the core value of really working with the learner and trying to um, meet the learner where they're at. The Ministry of Municipal Affairs funds the Literacy Outreach Coordination Program, and it's a really valuable model of government working together with communities to provide appropriate, relevant support as a literacy organisation, we're in a key position to determine how best to work within our community in a meaningful and realistic way. And so we're really grateful to be trusted with the autonomy to do that. And the LOC program really does provide that unique um, autonomous way of working. The Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Training plays a significant role with its long-term commitment to adult literacy through a program called the Community Adult Literacy Program, or the CALP. So CALPs work with hard to reach and vulnerable people. In Cornell, we have funding for two of these CALPs. Um, we're able to support individuals who want to increase their skills or improve their literacy knowledge, but they're not able to access similar support in other ways, and they're re not ready for um, institutionalized, more formal, regular learning. We're always grateful for this support. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to the staff of the Ministry of Advanced Ed who are consistently available, supportive and encouraging to groups such as ours. They're really collaborative with us and um, help us understand how to best use our funding. Helping someone improve their literacy skills can literally change their life. So I've seen it with my own eyes. If you've ever experienced the buzz of accomplishment when you put together a PowerPoint or if you've uploaded an app on your phone and you've actually been able to use it <laughs> or you're able to answer a question that helps someone else figure out something that was important to them, you've probably got an idea of what I'm talking about. And these are small milestones um, for, for fairly reasonably literate people. So imagine the impact of being able to read something independently for yourself or your child, or knowing that you can complete a training session because you understand the information being presented, or knowing that you are able to make 
um, a decision or vote in a way that actually has an impact because you understand what the issues are and, and how it works. So these are life-altering achievements. This is what we do with the funding awarded to us by various ministries and funding that we are successfully able to, um, to get in our fundraising efforts or our grant applications. This work produces a kaleidoscope of reactions. So it's difficult, rewarding, frustrating, endless work, and we need and we really want to keep doing it. That's the crux of my message to you today. So that please keep the funding in place. Increase it if you're able to, because um, the needs go up and so do the demands on what we are expected to do and what we want to do and what we see as necessary. So when we do one thing, it builds on another thing that we, we would like to continue doing. Um, when funding stays the same but the need increases, it, put pressure, it puts pressures on group to compete with one another rather than collaborate. And we really would rather collaborate than compete. Um, so please keep stable and secure funding in place for literacy programming. Keep the parameters wide so that we're able to continue to move within a flexible system of delivery. Um, and just, yeah, that my, my request is just please keep um, increasing the amount of funding that you give in that flexible way because we don't want to exclude anyone who seeks support and we're seeing different levels of support. Yeah, can. and that's okay. it. Okay, thank that's you, Rebecca. That's it. Okay, and already some members have indicated they want to ask some questions. So, okay. Megan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I saw you put in a written submission, so thank you for doing that. Uh, my question is just related to the CALP program that you spoke about uh, earlier on. How many uh, people do you see uh, accessing that program annually? So in Cornell, it differs because we're able to have um, regular registered users, but we're also able to help drop-ins. So um, I would say be, uh, between 15 and 30 are our regular users, and they're people that come in once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes for intense periods of time. So our coordinators will see someone two or three times a week for four weeks, and then they won't see them for a few weeks because they get busy doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, and that runs through sort of a nine to 10 month period. And then we see over the past year, we saw about 23 drop-in um, users who were accessing support for filling out forms. A lot came with the census and um, we'll probably see a spike in people when there's things like taxes to pay on their BC assessments and, and um, things like that. There were some people that needed help with the... Um, you know, downloading the QR code for your vaccine passport kind of thing. So there are moments where we see kind of influxes based on what's going on or what's the what's the request in the community. So it'd be fair to say somewhere around 50 to 100 people probably a year in the adult help program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rebecca. Um, and I agree with you with the app thing. I think we should have an app that teaches us how to use apps. Um, with regards to uh, your funding streams, uh, you talked about fundraising efforts and, and ministry funding and, and grant funding. Can you just kind of give us a, uh, the relationship of what those percentages would be of, of the overall program? So we have different programs at Literacy Cornell because we have stuff that directly impacts families and so we're able to access funding for that. But just as an example for our adult, um, adult literacy funding, I would say about 70% of what we spend working directly with adults comes from CALP. So it comes from that funding stream from the Ministry of Advanced Ed. And then we get um, one time or special funding that we try to go for. It might be a pilot project. It might be something that specifically addresses a skills need. Uh, but they're not long-term or sustainable. And so we do them when we can and inject a kind of a... Um, a learning model or some extra funding into our program 
but we know it's not going to be there the following year. So the kelp is our, for adult literacy, the kelp is our mainstay. And then with our society, when we raise funds, we kind of divvy it up between um, family literacy, early childhood stuff that we do, community-based stuff and adults specifically. Um, could you could you just like maybe just um, in this ballpark field, what percentage of your bu budget is comes from fundraising? Oh, from fundraising out in the community yeah. or fund? No fundraising. Um, oh, a very small amount. I would say ten, maybe fifteen percent. And we've seen over the last year and a half, of course, really it's really hard to fundraise because we haven't been able to have our in-person events that we like to have. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. Yeah. Thank you for coming and uh, making your presentation. And thank you so much for the, the work that you do. Yeah. Thank I think you. you've reminded us um, how isolating um, uh, a lack of literacy can be mm -hmm. and how liberating it can be mm -hmm. uh, when people uh, feel that they're uh, more liter literate. Uh, and I'm uh, personally struck by um, your comparison between collaboration and competitiveness and how a lack of funds um, can push uh, organizations into competing with each other mm -hmm. when they would rather be collaborating. Yeah. So thank you for that insight. Yeah, you're welcome. So. Thank you for having me here. And thanks for traveling different, from different directions to be here. Thank you. So we, uh, we are now scheduled to take a break until... No break. <laughs> We're on a really tight time schedule uh, this morning, so um, let's not take a break. We'll just uh, uh, go to our next presenter, uh, who is uh, uh, Dave King, Caledonia Ramblers Hiking Club. So, uh, so Dave, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we're timing it with our phones. When you have uh, 30 seconds uh, left, uh, Jennifer will ho hold up this card so that you know that it's time to wrap up, and uh, then we'll ask you questions. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm with the Caledonia Round Recycling Club and also the Prince George Backcountry Recreation Society. And uh, my presentation, I've sent in a written document already. I'm going to send in a slightly modified one, so a couple of editing things and one or two things like that, so I'll do that probably later today. Any case, um, we've, been, uh, we've had working relationships with BC Parks and Recreation Sites and Trails for many years and have volunteer working agreements with both uh, groups. And uh, basically, it's uh, very apparent to us and I think people all around the province that if it wasn't for volunteers, um, both BC Parks and Recreation Sites and Trails would be in pretty serious trouble. <clears throat> the maintenance of trails and other facilities within um, uh, parks and outside parks, uh, they just do not have the resources, staff, et cetera, uh, to, you know, to do the work that's needed. And uh, I just started, did a quick check this morning. I've spent, or the Caledonia Ramblers alone, have spent about 40 days this year out doing trail maintenance work. Um, that's, you know, that's not alone at all. Anyway, uh, on the recreation uh, sites and trails side of things, they look after, you know, uh, recreational activities on 80% of the landscape in the province. And uh, Parks Branch, a small amount, and part of it is, you know, urban and other things. And uh, they only have around 50 staff or 55 staff, some number like that. And, uh, and uh, they really don't have support staff. This year they did get a very small uh, summer work crews, but uh, you know they're just on for a short period of time. And it's the uh, uh, first time that's happened. And locally here, we got two people looking after the Prince George uh, and Mackenzie Forest districts, and there's absolutely no way that they can handle you know, look, manage all the recreation sites and all the trails in those, you know, the two areas. I mean, there's hundreds of kilometers of trails 
and uh, some are registered trails, uh, but there's many, many other trails out there which we, you know, have been in use for years, popular, very heavily used and very popular, but they're unregistered and they're just there. And uh, so if uh, somebody wants to go and do some industrial development, logging or something else, then the trail is, it's got no protection whatsoever. And if it's destroyed or severely impacted by a logging operation, there's nothing there um, to protect it even though it may have been there for 40 years or more. And a good example, Fraser Mountain, just out of uh, uh, west of uh, uh, Vanderhoof, starts in Beaumont Park. First two or 300 meters go up the mountain. We had a club trip there this weekend. Very crowded, many, many people on the trail. It's been there for years and years. Starts right off of Highway 16. So we, our feeling is that there really needs to be more resources. They, you know, they'd like to um, uh, designate more trails and get them properly registered under Section 56 under the uh, Act, but um, they can't, and they just don't have the people to go through the process of reviewing an application, and uh, they said just just can't do it, and we just can't out manage more trails and so on. So that they've got, eight, I understand, about an $8 million budget for the entire province, and they probably should have at least double that. And uh, we'd really like to see a permanent staff member in McKenzie. There's just no way that, that you know, the two people that are based in Prince George can handle uh, everything going on in McKenzie. And uh, there's it just, it's really a sad situation. Um, on BC Parks uh, side, I just very uh, briefly here. They, uh, they have uh, had some increase in funding, and they do have a summer work crew, but that summer, it's a summer work crew. And uh, with the COVID, uh, pandemic and other things going on, the use of backcountry trails and recre recreating in the wilds has just really, really gone up. And uh, the crews should be there all, all year round. It would be really nice to see a, a kind of a, a so-called summer work crew available throughout the winter to look after trails and so on. And um, yes, and so related to that, um, in some of the very heavily used parks, it would be really nice to see park interpreters as used to exist years ago, or um, uh, and sort of guides, interpreters, and to be there to t meet people, explain things and so on. And like the ancient forest park out there, uh, we uh, played a key role in establishing. Um, it would be nice to have somebody who's actually uh, ind indigenous be the interpreter out there, uh, because there's so many things that uh, they've pl played a role in, and in, in that, and uh, the way they use forest and medicinal plants, food, or, you know, different things there. Um, Anyway, that's the main uh, points and uh, I would like to make, and it's just that we just see it as a sad situation. The province is promoting recreation or tourism and using our parks, and but they're not providing the resources necessary to manage uh, you know, that activity. Thank you, Dave. Um, questions? Uh, ben. Mm. Well, Dave, thanks very much. And you know what? It wouldn't be possible without volunteers like yourself and the other people. You guys uh, really take it, you know, personally, etc. So, what I'm, uh, what I, if the government didn't, let's say, it can't find the necessary staff, for instance, if there was increased resources to the volunteer groups, uh, like you mentioned in your presentation about the uh, park enhancement funds. Is there, is there uh, something that might work for volunteer organizations like the Caledonia Ramblers uh, to help augment the volunteer efforts to uh, do that? Well, I must say that both Recreation Sites and Trails and Force or the Parks Branch has provided some monies. And um, uh, maybe a little more would help. I'm not quite sure about that. It's, uh, it's, you're asking a good question. I, I don't know if there's uh, you know, a little more money would be beneficial, but uh, you know to help cover uh, travel costs and you know gas and oil, chainsaw costs. You know, because occasionally you have to buy a new one and one you know these kind of things, yeah. but uh, not a lot more money. Uh, trail markers, uh, you know, middle trail markers. You know, purchase yeah. this kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I'll keep it up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other. Oh, Lauren. 
Just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I've hiked many of the areas uh, around uh, Prince George, uh, Grizzly Den and Robson and a few of those places, and I just appreciate your initiative. So thanks for making the presentation today. Yet, uh, Raven Lake Trail this summer. Use, uh, that's, you know, a whole other thing, the Hungry Creek Road that goes into it. Uh, it's outside of the park. And nobody's got any money to do any, you know, maintenance on it. And it's getting in pretty tough shape and 12 kilometers into the park boundary. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, locals had, had to get very busy to you know, do a lot of shovel work to make it passable because it uh, washed out in one location about five, four, three or four kilometers in this year. But there are 20 odd people in there on a the weekend. That's 20 vehicles as opposed to maybe four or five in past years. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Dave, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, your presentation, for bringing uh, this to our attention, and thank you for your um, commitment uh, to parks and, and trails. Um, I think it's something that we've, um, uh, speaking for myself, maybe have taken uh, for granted that they would always be there and available, but not without the work of people like yourself. So It's a big problem right now. Thank you. You've, yep. Yes, thank, thank you for that. So our uh, next presenter is uh, Nancy Harris uh, with Access BC, uh, SCIBC Regional Tourism Association. I'd just like to acknowledge Dave's uh, presentation. With, uh, Spinal Cord Injury BC has worked closely with the uh, Caledonia Ramblers. They have had great vision on access and inclusion throughout the years. We do a lot of training um, in the ancient forest and in rec sites and trails that are showing exemplary um, examples of accessibility. So I'd just like to acknowledge that after hearing Dave's oh, presentation. Lovely. Uh, uh, good morning, my name is Nancy Harris and I'm the Regional Development Liaison for Spinal Cord Injury BC and the Access BC Lead. I'm very pleased to be here today representing the Access BC, Pro, uh, BC program. Uh, it's a program that's very close to my heart after a number of years of uh, working as a volunteer and as a staff member. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to thank the province for providing opportunities that allow input into these consultations and to respectfully acknowledge the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples of the land we call BC, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We are grateful to be living, learning, and working on the lands of the Kleitle Tene on where these sessions are being held today. What is access and inclusion? To help answer this, I'd like to, uh, you to consider for a moment a quote by Dr. Scott Rains. What is so unique about a situation that justifies exclusion instead of what does it cost to make it accessible? I haven't thought of one, one answer yet. <laughs> uh, in in the, the concept of accessibility is ordinary for everybody. It is not about having a special solution or having a big price tag. It is not about labeling people or singling them out. Through all stages of our lives, we have already acquired and benefited from accessibility. As we age, accessibility will become more and more relevant to all of us. With a focus on outdoor recreation and tourism, Access BC aims to promote, expand accessibility throughout the province by continuing to implement universal design awareness and training, accessibility consultations and resource development, and by building and sustaining crucial partnerships. Through this week, we are positioning BC as a global leader in accessible tourism and helping create a province that is truly the best place for everyone to live, work, and play. My husband, Pat, has used a wheelchair since he was a child, and accessibility is an issue we face on a daily basis. From family outings to vacation planning to hotel stays, we are one of many that are always looking for solutions to make our travel experiences seamless and stress-free. For almost 40 years, we have advocated to increase inclusion for people with disabilities and for the past five years have been working hard with Access BC along with our tourism partners and community stakeholders to achieve this goal. What's next? As a provincial nonprofit community service organization, Spinal Cord Injury BC has worked tirelessly over the past six decades to improve access and inclusion for British Columbians with disabilities and their families. 
Spinal cord injury as BC is generally excited about the Accessible BC Act the province could, and the province's commitment to increase accessibility and inclusion for all in British Columbia. In this context, we are eager eager and motivated to continue expanding our Access BC initiative to all regions of the province as we help make BC the best place for people with disabilities and their families to live, work and be active. To date we have achieved our impact with minimal support, further advances that require additional dedicated funding that will allow us to expand the scope of our impact and leverage the invaluable partnerships and collaborations we have developed. Priority initiatives to be undertaken include expanding our regional access and inclusion liaisons positions. Uh, we're currently working with regional tourism association partners to expand the scope of accessibility in these positions within each uh, region of the province. Leveraging additional opportunities through partnerships with our tourism association, local government, nonprofit, and private, se private sector partners to develop and deliver accessible tourism products and experiences and promoting promotional materials, universal design and accessibility education and training for all stakeholders, best practice models and evaluation of accessible tourism related practices. Accessible employment and customer service are high on our priorities and uh, although we are making great strides uh, with accessibility, there's more to be done. Accessible tourism requires accessible communities and the partnerships we are creating today. We look forward to having interventions and let them begin. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and now I'll uh, invite members of the committee to uh, ask you any questions. Great. Ben? Um, thanks very much, uh, Nancy. That was great. And, you know, the documents you have submitted are very comprehensive. Uh, you know, I saw a video a while back, and it was from this area about people that were having accessibility to some of the things. And I like your quote at the start, what is access of inclusion? And, and I don't think I got the whole thing, but I have to say that I did, uh, the message to me is very clear that we can do more. And uh, anyways, I uh, appreciate your presentation. Thank you. And uh, the work that you're doing with Dave and uh, others to, you know, bring that outdoor access. And, and the other thing you talk about in your last component is about uh, the access BC positions for tourism. I think that that is an under, uh, not exploited, but an underutilized opportunity. So I would encourage you to continue to, I think that um, all across, and you've d highlighted uh, some of the things going on in my riding, like the KVR and mm -hmm. Penticton and things like that. But we do have to make certain that uh, we're doing more on that, so thank you. Absolutely, thank you for that. This speech will be attached uh, um, to the, our presentation material, so if you want to look at that quote again. And my uh, ALS signer, sign, signer wasn't able to be with us today because they had a family emergency, so we like to keep showing that the respectfulness of all inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you very much. much. Okay, our... Um, Next presenter is uh, Mayor Lynn Hall, City of Prince George. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and I'll, uh, I think you have uh, our presentation. Uh, I'll keep my comments uh, to the five minutes. Uh, as you know, uh, we are on the traditional territory of the Clightly Tanay. I'd like to acknowledge that. And uh, just to give you a little overview, Prince George is the largest city north of Kamloops. Uh, we're a population uh, of about 85,000 people, and uh, we're famously known early on uh, a few decades ago as BC's northern capital, so we'll try to revive that a bit today. Uh, if I could, um, given the fact that we're the largest city in, in, in the north, uh, we have become really, for all intents and purposes, a hub city for a tremendous amount of services uh, throughout the central and northern interior. Uh, and. Uh, these level of services that I'll key in on today are really around health care, and the two uh, presentations that we've left with you are specific to that. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I do want to say uh, that we have had great collaboration and discussion with a multitude of ministries in government uh, as a result of the two things that I'm going to speak to. 
Uh, the first request uh, really focuses in on the challenges that we have addressing infrastructure and resource requirements for individuals with complex needs in relation to housing and services, uh, which is uh, really impacting municipalities, not just in this province, but throughout the country. Uh, the City of Prince George is requesting that the province's 2022 budget include sufficient financial resources to ensure that Prince George has the facilities and services necessary to ensure those with mental health and or substance use disorders can quickly access both emergency and ongoing services and supports. And this includes sobering beds, uh, treatment and recovery services, as well as supported housing that serves vulnerable individuals living with complex and overlapping mental health and addiction needs. And you've certainly all heard the discussion around complex care. Uh, and I belong to the uh, BC Urban Mayor's Caucus, 13 uh, municipalities in the province uh, that are represented by us. And a big part of the conversation at that table is around complex care and what does it look like. So we're having those conversations with our health authorities and with the Ministry of Health just to try to determine what that model looks like. Uh, the second request was around the University Hospital of Northern BC. Uh, and I will tell you that it's in profound need of additional acute beds and associated outpatient services to fulfill both its local community hospital and regional tertiary care functions. Treasury Board has approved a concept plan in February 2020 and the business plan phase is now nearing completion. <clears throat> the City of Prince George is requesting that the project be prioritized in the government's 10-year capital plan to ensure funding availability in 2022 to enable the project to proceed to procurement and construction. So those two, two items that I talk about are really tied together. Uh, the University Hospital here is integral to the north and you've probably heard quite often that we service half of the geographical area of the province. And so we have communities like Fort Nelson, for example, Fort St. John, but small communities of 800, 500 people, plus our First Nations communities along Highway 16 and Highway 97 that really depend on Prince George to provide those health care services. And so that's why we really took the opportunity to focus on this. We accept that responsibility as a hub city to provide those services. And I think really what I'm asking today, uh, aside from these two proposals, is really that we want to partner with, with the province. That's key for us. Uh, we find it just uh, absolutely necessary to have that strong partnership. So we hope that uh, uh, you folks can take that back uh, and uh, uh, let your colleagues know the position that we are in and the position that we want to take. And we want to continue to be that hub city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, questions from the committee? Harwinder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, more so comment, and thank you, Mayor Hall, for your thank presentation. You. Having to live in uh, communities surrounding Terrace and Mackenzie, my family and we've accessed uh, not only Prince George Hospital from yeah. both communities, and uh, I know uh, patients you would often talk to from Fort St. John, and mm -hmm. so far, like I can imagine, um, I don't know what would be surrounding community do without Prince George from you know every. A facility that they don't exist in small towns like Mackenzie. Yeah. So thank you for highlighting uh, uh, these, uh, you know, the issues and uh, the need for services. Um, again, just yeah, more welcome. so comment and thank you for the yeah. work you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mike and then your group. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mayor. Um, in your request, there's a there's a photo. Uh, and it says uh, construction begins on an integrated health and housing site yeah, September 2021. So is your request that's there in addition to that site that's there? Yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, so we have a partnership with Northern Health and a partnership with BC Housing that I should have mentioned. Uh, and it's a strong partnership. Uh, we have an MOU. Uh, the three of us have signed uh, with respect to this integrated health model. This integrated health model in phase one will provide 50 units of health services to people with opioid uh, uh, addiction and mental illness. Uh, and phase two, uh, which we're thinking will be somewhere two to three years down the road, uh, will provide those services as well. So we're looking at about 100 uh, beds, 100 units to help uh, these folks. But it's very specific. It's health care driven uh, and it's beyond supportive housing. It will give those health care uh, professionals an opportunity to treat uh, folks with those two afflictions. Um, thank you, Chair. And just to, to follow up on, on what you just said, 
with regards to the second site, is, is there a site in mind? Um, and and um, uh, how is the community uh, taking that? Because we all know that NIMBY yeah. uh, comes into play no matter where you are in the province of BC. This is on First Avenue, more of an industrial commercial location. Currently, uh, it's uh, NR Motors, which is a recreation uh, dealership. Uh, we've purchased that land. We've purchased two block, uh, two pieces of it. Phase one uh, was a single purchase. Phase two, where they're still operating from, will be where we put uh, that uh, second uh, phase of the of the model. A uh, little bit of nimbyism. There's no question about it, but not as much as you would see if we went to a residential area. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Group. Thanks, Mayor, for coming and uh, making very brief and very powerful presentation about two outstanding issues. Uh, the, uh, the hospital issue you're talking about, I, I'm aware that uh, the concept plan was uh, approved and subsequently funded, and now the business case is probably, I don't know where it is, probably close to completion. And uh, subsequently, it goes to tendering process. Mm -hmm. So, like, what you're really requesting uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, presentation, I would like to be a bit more clear. Sure. I understand uh, the budget has to be in, in ten, ten year, uh, what you call the capital plan. Uh, is that the ask you're asking about this? Yeah. So the ask is is I guess fairly specific in terms of uh, moving to the next step, which is procurement. Mm -hmm. uh, the business plan has been uh, underway. Uh, and certainly if this could happen next year, I'd be ecstatic, but we know that it's going to take time. We understand that it's a long process. So the, uh, for me today, it's, it's about uh, proceeding to the next step, which is procurement and construction down the road in a few years. Okay. The other question I want to ask you about the mental health and addiction. Uh, as a mayor of the city, uh, if you can probably elaborate a bit more as to what specifically, like, you, would you like to see in the city that will actually help or change, uh, bring a positive change? So the opioid crisis, uh, and I'm sure you know this, uh, if we take a look at uh, the uh, number of cases that we have in the Northern Health Authority, which stretches from Quinell to Haida Gwaii to uh, the Yukon border, uh, you prorate that population, and we are the highest uh, in opioid deaths uh, in the province. So really when we take a look at the mental illness and the opioid crisis and its impact on communities, we're looking for that complex care facility that can take care of many of the folks that are very difficult to be treated, difficult to be put into facilities like that. Uh, but we're really seeing an influx of those two particular issues in our community, well, throughout the entire region, but they migrate to Prince George because we have the services. And as I said earlier, if we're going to provide those services, I think we then now have to focus on complex care facilities. Uh, and and uh, the, as you know, and, and you've heard it in other communities, the hospital just doesn't have the capacity at this point, given the pandemic and its fourth uh, wave. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Megan. Madam Chair, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Thank you for your presentation, you. Mayor. Uh, so very quickly, in your uh, last paragraph, you were talking about advocating for emergency services, uh, including sobering beds and on-demand treatment. Uh, do you have any of those yet at all uh, accessible within your community? And secondly, how many people do you think are approximately waiting for these types of emergency services within the region you serve? So BC Housing is currently working on a project that could provide sobering beds, fingers crossed, within the next probably 12 to 24 months. Uh, when I talk about treatment and recovery services, uh, they're either given by nonprofit social service agencies or by Northern Health. And uh, access is, um, it's like you folks, you've got a timetable, I have a timetable on many things. And it's about access on a particular day at a particular time. And I think what we're looking for is that emergency access for people that are suffering and families can take those individuals to those emergency locations at the drop of a hat. Uh, so we have probably on our streets, um, I, uh, I, I'm hazarding a guess here, but I have to think 200, 250 people. 
Okay, and you don't have just drop in emergency beds anywhere no. right now? Okay, no. all right, thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, with that, uh, Mayor Hall, I'd like to thank you on behalf of yeah. the committee for taking uh, time out of what must be an incredibly uh, busy schedule uh, to, to um, talk about a very important thing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I live in a lower mainland city surrounded by other cities. And uh, e explaining the implication of being a hub city in the north um, uh, is me very meaningful. Thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for everything you're doing and greatly appreciate this. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. And our uh, final presenter uh, here in Prince George today is uh, Amanda Alexander, representing YMCA's of British Columbia. So, Amanda, you have five minutes. Um, we're keeping time. And um, when you have 30 seconds left, uh, Jennifer will indicate. And uh, that'll give you, you know, shifting, that'll help you shift into wrapping up. And then we'll ask you some questions. Sounds great. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Amanda Alexander, and it's my privilege to be the CEO of the YMCA of Northern BC. Uh, I am here to present on behalf of the five YMCAs across British Columbia. YMCA of Northern BC serves children and families in diverse traditional territories, home to numerous First Nations and Indigenous groups, and so I'd like to begin to acknowledge that I'm presenting to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Klaitli Tene First Nation. YMCA is submitting two recommendations for your consideration today uh, for Budget 2022 that align with several of the priorities in your consultation paper. The first recommendation relates to building a stable foundation to grow a universal child care system in BC, specifically the need for rapid increase in early childhood education professionals. And the second is to commit to a three-year funding for the YMCA YMINDS uh, program to support youth mental wellness. I'll start with early learning and child care. Right now, uh, we are so grateful to live in a province and really appreciate your leadership where there's a synergy between our provincial and our federal governments on the importance of um, early childhood education that is connected to economic um, recovery and healthy child development. We want to acknowledge the province's leadership and we are pleased to be partners at the table to work, connect, um, work with you on building a universal child care system. We are the largest uh, child care provider in British Columbia. Uh, we have over 3,500 spaces in early years in school age care. And we are a large employer of 750 child care staff. But our ability to keep growing spaces is hampered by the lack of trained early childhood educators. This is a problem in the north and all across BC. YMCAs currently have vacancies in 121 child care staff positions. And it's specific to the work that I've been doing in the north, uh, we've been working with uh, Northern Health around the medical staffing crisis. We see childcare as part of that solution and being able to um, encourage people to come and work in the north and stay in the north. But they won't do that without um, adequate childcare provision. And we can't step up and provide the solution unless we have early childhood educators. We want to do this and we want to do this in a different way. <clears throat> this strategy is not possible without child care workers. MCFD tells us we need 18,000 ECEs more to implement the child care plan. In order to achieve this, we need a new, innovative strategy, one that incentivizes people uh, into the child care field. We need to come together, the education system, post-secondary, child care sectors, all levels of government, to figure out how to change the system of recruitment and training of all childhood educators. For your consideration, I'd like to recommend the recruitment of trained ECEs move to an apprentice program. It's estimated that the cost of the two-year early childhood education program, including living expenses and tuition, would cost someone approximately $20,000. Trades programs aren't required to complete unpaid practicums. In fact, they are paid for their work experience and receive paid benefits while attending school. Furthermore, upon graduation and throughout their career, they're making higher wages. People, predominantly women, who wish to educate and engage in a career of early childhood education experience significant financial burden compared to those that engage in trades education. Developing an early childhood educator apprentice program will not only value the role of child care workers, but most importantly find a solution to our child care crisis. This is the most urgent step towards an affordable, high quality early learning and child care system in BC. 
Our second recommendation is to continue funding our YMIND program for youth mental wellness. YMIND is a community-based program that supports youth with mild to moderate anxiety. Since receiving the funding from the province in 2017, it has extended supports for teens and youth to 44 communities throughout BC. Mind Medicine is an adaptation through Indigenous partnerships to better serve Indigenous youth. As of December 2020, we have reached more than 1,800 youth experiencing anxiety across the province and trained over 400 program facilitators in urban and rural communities. Um, this program has been rigorously evaluated and shows that it makes a difference. Youth who are experiencing anxiety reduce their anxiety and as well learn to live and cope successfully with that anxiety present. We are seeking $1.5 million over the next three years, 4.5 in total, to reach 40 communities annually with 900 youth participating each year. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to hearing our recommendations for funding in both child care and youth mental health. We look forward to helping the province reach your goals um, in these areas and look forward to more opportunities to see what we hear and experience in communities to inform policy and roll out programs that benefit young people and families across our province. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'll now invite uh, members of the committee to ask questions. Greg. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, your recommendation and suggestion with respect to the uh, uh, on-site apprenticeship program training makes so much sense. Uh, it reduces cost, plus those individuals are going to be able to participate and help with that staff shortage right out of the gate. Meanwhile, paying taxes and actually contributing uh, to the economy. So, you know, I don't know quite why uh, it has taken so long uh, for uh, government to give strong consideration to it, but I I'm certainly very supportive of that approach. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Um, MLA Kylo touched a little bit on, on where I was going to go with my question related to it because it does seem like it's such a fantastic idea. Where are those conversations? I know you touched on it a bit, but where are the conversations at right now with the EC apprentice model? How, how are they going generally? I, I only heard a little bit of what you were saying on that. Yeah, so um, there's been little, there's been pockets. Mm -hmm. I, my sense is that if it was a top-down conversation to say this is the model that we want to see that takes that has the right people um, at the right levels of government and of education to actually mandate that, uh, it's very difficult for us to create a program, say, with Northern Lights College, uh, as opposed to the province, in, the province exploring those conversations. So really my ask is about um, those people that have, um, who have the power and authority to, to create that, to come to the table. We might be part of that solution, absolutely. Um, but, but at this point, it is, it is more difficult for us to make that change at a very individual level than uh, something that is, um, that is created at a higher level. So you'd like to see sort of a provincial conversation about this? Okay. Absolutely. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much, um, Amanda. Um, you mentioned a number of 18,000 with MCFD. Could you just uh, explain that a little bit more? Because that, that number, is that the shortage that you're referring to in ECE child educators? Um, well, it's, it's a combination. It's the shortage, but it's also about reaching the targets of how many child care positions the province has targeted in order to meet the needs um, in, in the communities across our province. So, um, so child care providers won't be able to open spaces unless they have um, early childhood educators and in and in many areas we're staffing with early childhood educator assistants because really it, it's impossible for us um, to, to get the required amount of ECEs. So it's not only about meeting our, our current needs, it's about the province's targets um, in order to meet the child care needs across our province. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you. I think to, to Ben's point, uh, I've certainly seen that in some of the communities in the Shushwap variety that I represent where many of the existing daycare providers, we haven't seen net increase. We've just seen uh, unlicensed facilities become licensed, and so we have not seen the net gain uh, because it largely comes down to, to the shortage of staff that are actually have the appropriate training. 
and so uh, you know, we see, need to obviously take a different approach uh, because we're not seeing a net increase in spaces around the province. Part of it has to do with the shortage, but also has to do with the new funding mechanism, which has just moved unlicensed daycare providers into a licensed facility with no net gain to communities. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I know the province has been um, fabulous about the wage increases, um, but that in itself hasn't moved the needle. It's also created compression issues for any of our staffing that are um, that are managers or supervisors. They don't get the wage subsidy. So it, it's been a great movement, but it ha it actually is is never been as bad as I've experienced. I mean, COVID is layering into it for sure because all of a sudden, and I would say to you in the in the fourth wave, you no, know, like uh, no. Of the other three waves, we we did not have exposures in our child care center. It is now happening very consistently in our child care facilities where we're having exposures and exposures with children, not just staff. Um, particularly, I serve communities um, in the north that are unvaccinated, um, have the highest rates of unvaccination. So we're having this compounding issue that's happening in the pandemic where we then have um, closures as a result, um, where we either can't meet ratio or um, and predominantly that's it because our staff are off and so um, and they're having to monitor for symptoms um, and again I'm very worried about the the uh, implications of children that are experiencing COVID and in, in literally in the last few weeks um, in our YMCA facilities and it is no different than others and I know I tangent but it, the, the the piece is that it is very complex and the movement we've made that you've spoken about has been good but we need something bigger and more robust that will help really re-inject and and solve the problem in a, in a more um, robust way uh, well with that uh, Amanda I'd like to thank you um, on behalf of the committee uh, for taking the time to come and uh, present to us and um, I, I think it's quite a, appropriate um, that you are our last presenter of the morning in that you've really reinforced um, why it's important to build a budget based on public consultation mm. and to hear from uh, people like yourself about what your challenges are but also what your suggested solutions are. Um, I think you've intrigued us and uh, we will be talking more about it. So thanks again. Great. Thank you very much. And I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Meeting adjourned. <laughs>